Yeah, thanks, thanks so much, Nate, for inviting me to speak tonight. And um, yeah, I was very lucky to know John Kinsman, too. He's actually like the grandfather I never really had. I mean, he's an amazing person. And I first met him when I was a graduate student at UW-Madison, because there was this farmer picketing outside the student union about bovine growth hormone. And that was John Kinsman warning, warning people way back in the early, well, late 1980s, early 90s, that bovine growth hormone was coming. And they were serving on campus without FDA approval or permission. And, um, so I, I think part of the reason I was asked to speak tonight is I also happen to teach economics at Madison College. So a lot of you might have had really sad experiences of economics from school. I mean, a lot of people describe it as a dismal science. Some people call it an advanced form of brain disease. Um, so I want, I want to sort of try to dispel that. I mean, yes, there's horrible economics out there. And I want to give people like some tools, I think, for alternative versions of economics that can really help us, I think, reclaim our state and restore our rural economy. So, so that's one thing I'm hoping to do tonight. Um, George Orwell has written a lot about politics. <laughs> And one of the uh, more interesting quotes he gave, actually in a book called Road to Wiggins Pier, which a lot of people haven't read, is he talked about, you know, we have statues everywhere for politicians and bishops, but we don't have statues for cooks and gardeners. And I want you to think about that, like how we really take things like food for granted in our society. We do not honor or valorize or celebrate people who are actually feeding us every day. Instead, we elevate politicians and other people. I mean, we saw this at the White House with Donald Trump inviting in junk food you know, to serve to guests. You know, I mean, that, that type of food system is not what we should be all about. So what we, tonight, I'd like to have us think a little bit about what is the true measure of wealth in our society? How do we really measure, you know, are we rich or not, or poor as people? How do we measure those things? Now, I can tell you right now, it's not with a pile of money. That is not the goal. That should not be the goal of anyone here. That's definitely not the goal of economics. For those who study economics, economics is about maximizing happiness for the most people. That's the goal of economics. And so that does not mean one person dying with a big pile of money under their bed, and like I won. No, that's not how economics should be evaluated. So, so I just wanted to touch on a few things about where we're at right now. And a lot of you might know this experience. I mean, I'm a child of the 1980s farm crisis. My neighbor committed suicide at his kitchen table because he was about to lose the farm. And this is happening now. I mean, we have this problem now, right? So you've probably heard in the headlines, Western Wisconsin has the highest number of farm bankruptcies in the United States. And that's really an underestimate, because most people don't go into bankruptcy to lose their farms. They just lose their farms, right? So that's just, that's actually the iceberg of the problem. We've lost most of our family farms since World War II. We've lost half of our dairy farms in this state just in the last 15 years, not even 10 years. We lost 700 last year alone. So we're getting to the point where, you know, I look at the Wisconsin license plate as this little barn on it and some, you know, that's going to become an endangered species in our own state. You know, it's happening under our watch. Um, we have twice as many prisoners in Wisconsin now as dairy farmers. I never thought we'd be at that point. I mean, and I, in fact, and I know some of those prisoners are dairy farmers for lots of reasons, okay? But I mean, that's, you know, that's, and what does that lead to? We have a Epidemic of violence, I would say, you know, not just suicides and accidents, which in a lot of cases are suicides, right? People know that. Um, drug addiction, domestic, I mean, you can see all the cascading effects of this crisis in our, in our rural communities. At the same time, we're being told there's too much milk, right? Too much milk out there, too much milk. And I look and I see 100 tanker loads of milk rolling into Wisconsin every day from Michigan, Ohio, I mean, I go to, to stores in Madison and, and pick up organic milk, and it's going, whoa, this plant number is from Texas. This organic milk being sold in Madison. Oh, this is from Utah. And they're saying there's too much milk here. Well, obviously, if you're a dairy processor, it's a lot cheaper to bring in milk from other parts of the country and dump it into Wisconsin and get rid of all the farmers here, right? Um, so this is happening as well. We even had the leader of our Dairy 2.0 task force say, if dairy farmers must be sacrificed to save the dairy industry, that's quite all right. I mean, that's what was quoted in the paper. I was like, whoa, excuse me? Like we can have a dairy industry without dairy farmers? We'll have a Petri dish generating protein? Yeah, I don't know what, what their vision is, but yes, as a UW employee. Yeah, so, um, so we have this problem. Um, we heard today at the, at the conference, land grabbing. When a farm goes under, who gets that farm? 
Is it going to be owned by a bank? Is it going to be owned by a pension fund, which could care less about what the land's being used for? Right? It's just a commodity speculation for them. Um, some of you might remember a few years ago, a Swiss-based pension fund bought 9,800 9, acres in Grant County for $7,000 an acre. 67 million they plopped down in one purchase, bought it up, right? So who's owning the land? I mean, 100 years ago, 90% of the farmers in this country owned the land they farm. What is that today? Less than 50%. I mean, a lot of farmers are in rented land. They're owned by a bank, basically, right? Um, and the largest wealth transfer in the U.S. is happening right now. You know, my parents are moving on eventually, right? Who's going to inherit their farm? Who's going to inherit all this land, right? Is it going to be consolidated? Should we have more farmers, not less? I would argue we want more farmers, not less. More people owning land. I mean, that's part of the whole idea of, like, democracy way back when. Like, oh, lots of small landholders can be independent. And, you know, we have less than 70 African-American farmers left in Wisconsin. Less than 70? How'd that happen? That didn't just happen. Yes, in the whole state. There used to be many more, right? We used to have whole communities of African-American farmers who moved up here after the Civil War, right? They could get land and they set up, you know, what happened to that? 16% of people in the state live in poverty, rural people in the state live in poverty. That's more than urban areas, right? You probably, you've seen it, right? I mean, driving parts through parts of Wisconsin looks like Appalachia to me. And I've, I have uncles who live in West Virginia. I'm going, whoa, this county is poor. Um, highest rates of hunger are amongst in rural places. People growing food, but they have nothing to eat. We talked, someone mentioned today, like we have farmers on food stamps. Not uncommon. Not unusual. Can't eat field corn. Right? And maybe you'll see a patch of rhubarb still growing where grandma used to have a garden, but now people can't do that anymore, right? They have another job. They're growing commodity crops. One in five kids in Wisconsin live in poverty. We've talked about this, right? And what are we left fighting over for our development options? We've, seen, we've talked about some of this today, right? Do you, is the only development option for your community to have a toxic mine? A high voltage power line? A prison? You lost your farm, now you're stuck hauling manure for the giant factory farm down the road? Are those your only job options in the state if you're living in a rural area? We would hope not. And this didn't just happen, right? I mean, we have government agencies that I would argue have been totally become corrupted, right? The DNR is becoming this rubber stamping permit agency. I mean, I actually had a friend told me the other day, he went to some DNR meeting, the DNR employee said, all I do is issue permits. I was going, what? I mean, aren't you supposed to be safeguarding the natural heritage of the state? Isn't that your job, to make sure we all have clean air and clean water? And you're just like, issuing permits to polluters all day long, that's all you do. We have the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Hmm, consumer protection. It's part of the title of that agency. Have they been doing a lot of consumer protection lately? Or are they just approving factory farms and people are getting well water that's contaminated and the DNR is going along with it? Would you be happy if a public health official told you just pour more bleach down your well? to solve your pollution problem. And I have heard that from public health officials in the state. That is irresponsible. That is not a solution to the problem. And now they're proposing pollution trading. Does anyone feel their watershed is under polluted? Don't you think you need more pollution in your watershed to help reduce the pollution in that watershed over there? I and mean, that's what water pollution trading does, right? Just moves pollution around. Now we've made a problem a commodity that people can make money off of. Moving around, that sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. Already has been a disaster in other places. And then on top of that, we have trade wars. Only making things worse, right? People probably heard about, well, the White House is providing $10 million for Wisconsin farmers to help them weather the trade crisis. Did any farmers here apply for some of this trade money? Trade bailout money. How much did you get? <laughs> I heard some farmers got only a dollar after filling out all the paperwork. Over 200 farmers got less than 100 bucks after filling out all this paperwork. Where did all this money go? It was like a slap in the face. Total slap in the face. So I mean, this is, you know, and then we have climate chaos. So now, you know, I turn on the news today and it's like, oh my gosh, 
We have m billions of dollars worth of damage, farms underwater. I'll have to admit that I've been to some of those communities in Zimbabwe too, where that crisis is happening there. I've actually been there. I'm going, oh my gosh, that was a successful permaculture community, now underwater, destroyed by climate crisis. So I want to share like what I think are like some false solutions to this, because right now we're having lots of people coming out with, oh, I got the solution to the problem. Here's some examples. One I already mentioned, pollution trading, bad idea, bad idea. In economics, we have this idea of goods and services. We don't promote ills and disservices. People understand the difference, why we call it a good and a service, like it's something you want. An ill is something you do not want. A disservice is like getting robbed. I mean, that's not something you want, okay? So pollution is a ill. It's not something we want to promote in the economy. So if you turn pollution into a commodity that people can just buy and sell, then they have a reason to create it and trade it. And then only the rich people can afford to buy them off, not to get hurt. Does this sound like a protection racket? I lived in New York City for a couple years. This is a protection racket. Like you pay the kid not to destroy your car while you're in the building, right? Here's some money. Please don't hurt my car. Right? That, that's what I would argue pollution training is like. One size fits all regulation. People have heard this. Like we need to have a level playing field. We should have one rule for everybody in the state, i.e. livestock siting law, right? We'll have one law for all farms in the state which want to be you know, producing all these cows and so on. Well, what happens as a result of that? Do we lose local control? Yes, that's what happened in the state. We lost local control. So now as a local community, you have no say over what happens, right? The state will impose that on you. That is the absolute antithesis of democracy in my vision, in my view, right? Free market, does anyone here think a free market gives you a fair price? <laughs> Not, no, no. I mean, I have to teach a whole unit in my class in oligopolies and monopolies, and people have this weird idea like, oh, everything's a free market. I'm going, well, the freest market you're going to find in your community is probably the farmer's market. You can actually walk around and negotiate, and there's different people with different prices. I challenge my students every time, go into a Walmart and try to haggle <laughs> at the checkout with a cashier about what you're paying for. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. That's not a free market. So if you want fair prices, you want consumer safety, I can tell you right now, free market is not going to be providing that for you. Trickle down economics does not work. Okay, I have to teach this in my classes. There's like a whole unit on it. It just does not work. So some of you might have heard about this Wall Street meeting, I think it was last November, right, where the, some White House official was there and all these CEOs were there and he asked sort of honestly, like, so how many of you used your tax cut to create more jobs and people laughed. Did people hear about this? People literally laughed. No one raised their hand. No one had to use their tax cut to create any jobs. What did they do with it? Yeah. Yes, they bought back stock. They moved the money offshore. They probably bought a whole bunch of imported luxury goods to make our trade deficit even worse. I mean, I can think of all sorts of other things they did with that money which was not creating jobs, right? And that's, and, and the fact that they couldn't even raise their hand and just laughed was, so John Kenneth Galbraith, who's a famous economist, once said, if you feed the horse enough oats, some of that will trickle through onto the road for the sparrows to eat, right? And that's what trickle-down economics is all about, right? <laughs> You'll get a few crumbs, but the rest of us will just be left, you know, waiting for some crumbs, right? So what are some positive alternatives? And this is what I'm hoping we can have a more of a discussion about. Like, how can we get out of this mess, okay? And Many of you have probably read Kathleen Kramer's book. Has anyone read that, The Politics of Resentment? A few people have read it, okay. So I've talked to Kathleen Kramer a lot about the book. I thanked her for doing the book, and I challenged her to do, write a second book called The Politics of Empowerment, where rural people, instead of just complaining and griping and making some you know, knee-jerk political decisions, actually organize and reclaim their politics and elect people that represent them and change the system to help them, right? And this has happened in Wisconsin history. That's, that's what's sort of sad. Like we have forgotten all these amazing episodes in our own state past that have shown that rural people, often with urban allies, can organize to really bring about change. It's happened many times in the state. You know, I can think of Aldo Leopold as an example, like going into Coon Valley, which is not that far from here, organizing farmers and creating soil and water conservation that we still enjoy today. I mean, you can drive through there and see amazing contours, forests that have been set up. 
I mean, that was not, that didn't just happen. That was a visionary op, you know, effort with involving hundreds, not thou even thousands of farmers. You know, we've had similar experiences in our state. So something to think about, how can we move, you know, move beyond that? Economic growth is not economic equality. Okay, I have to always remind my students about this. Just because you go and get a pizza, if the pizza's not sliced fairly, how do you solve the problem that the pizza's not sliced fairly? Do you just get a bigger pizza? If the slices are still the same as before, the same unfair slicing? I mean, that's what a lot of our certain politicians will propose as a solution. We'll just grow the pie and keep the slices all unfairly cut. Why can't we grow the pie and cut the slices differently? Redistribute some of the wealth to the people who need it, right? And how we measure that in economics is something called the Gini coefficient. So I'd really encourage people when people go, oh, the economy is booming, GNP per capita went up. I'm going, what does that even mean? I mean, does anyone here know the richest people in Wisconsin? This is one of my challenges for my students. I want you to find the five richest people in Wisconsin. Tell me where they live and what they did to get that money. This is one of my extra credit assignments for my class. Students love it. Does anyone know any of these rich people? Yeah, so we got, we got John Menard in Eau Claire County, someone I know works for Kohler. Kohler. <laughs> yep, Hendrix. Okay, good, very good. Does anyone know that Mr. Cargill lives in Wisconsin? Mr. McMillan, who owns Cargill, he lives right across the river. He lives in Wisconsin. So I'm sure he's totally blown out of the water the income in that one county where he lives because he's like one of the richest people in the world, right? So those people are in your community. Think about what they're contributing to your community, right? I mean, they would not, they would not be there without you. So maybe it's something to ask him about. But a Gini co, yep, well, well yeah, I'm gonna talk about the Packers in a moment, the Green Bay Packers. Interesting example of a different model, right? So I wanted to talk about co-ops. Why are co-ops an interesting model? It's a little bit different than a corporation, right? Anyone here belong to a co-op? Most of you probably do. 2.7 million people in Wisconsin belong to a co-op. A lot of them don't even know. I mean, I belong to like five. I'm at a consumer co-op. I have my money at a credit union. I lived in a housing co-op. You know, I'm like all these co-ops. So what's different about a co-op than a corporation? One member, one vote. A little bit different democracy going on there, right? Than one share, one vote. Does a co-op cut and run when times get tough? No. no, and that is what is so different about a co-op. And the UN had the year of the co-ops a couple years ago and, and, and emphasized that. After the 2009, 2010 financial meltdown around the world, co-ops thrived while corporations took their money and ran. That's because co-ops don't leave the community they're in. They can't. They're, they're supposed to serve their members in their community through hell or high water. So a lot of people don't know that during the financial meltdown, banks reduced their lending. You probably all know this, they, this part. They reduced their lending by $31 billion, right? Financial crisis. Not going to loan money out. Sorry, guys. No money for you anymore. Guess what credit unions did? Increased their lending by $35 billion. Same time period. Did we bail out any credit unions? No, because they did not engage in risky investments and subprime mortgages and all this other stuff the banks were doing, right? Because that's not part of their mission. So you can see how a co-op might be different. So get to the Green Bay Packers. Only co-op allowed in the professional football league. We have three co-ops in Canada, by the way. Canadians have more co-ops in sports than we do, <laughs> right? After they created, people know the history of why they created a co-op for the Green Bay Packers? They were having a financial crisis back in 1920s. So they restructured as a not-for-profit co-op. Can the Green Bay Packers ever leave Green Bay? Yes. No. Only if all the shareholders vote to do it. And all the money yeah. goes to the VFW club. Mm -hmm. In Green Bay. Yep. Can so, you imagine <laughs> an eighty billion dollar BFW club. That's pretty pricey. Yep. So, like when they needed seventy million dollars to rehab Lambeau Field, what did they do? They didn't go to the state to ask for money, like happened in Milwaukee, right? When they built the Brewers Stadium, all that scandal we can talk about, right? People call it Velveeta Gate. Joel could tell you all about this. They basically financed that stadium off the backs of dairy farmers through price gouging at the Green Bay Cheese Exchange, but we can talk more about that later. But instead, the co-op up in Green Bay issued shares, right? They said, oh, we want more shareholders. Guess how many, what's the maximum number of shareholders you can have in a professional sports team in the US? 35. 
max. All these other sports teams can only have 35 max shareholders because they want to be able to move when they want, right? Oh, we're going to move to Miami. We're going to ship over here. We're going to shut this down and get out, head out of town. Green Bay Packers have over 360,000 shareholders. The most you can have is 200 shares as one member. And when they needed $70 million, they just issued 280,000 more shares at two, and they sold out in five weeks. They raised $70 million in five weeks as a co-op self-investment policy. I mean, that shows like we have wealth and resources in this community if we want to bother reinvesting them in things in our community. Otherwise, we'll just go to Wall Street or wherever it goes, right? So that's just you know, something else to think about. I mean, we talked about economic self-sufficiency versus economic dependency. We talked a lot about this today at the, at the Grassroots Festival. What is the multiplier effect of what you're doing in the community? Whether it's a consumer or a producer, where's your money going? Yeah, hopefully, yeah, well, that might stay in the community. I don't know. If I spend money at a Walmart, where is it going to go? Fort, it's going to be off to Fort Benning, Arkansas, probably within an hour, okay? Two hours. Gone. If I go to the farmer's market, is that like a different economy? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm actually giving my money straight to a farmer. No middle people involved. Is that farmer asking me for a fair price? Or am I holding a gun to his head? You're going to sell those tomatoes to me? If, no, no. I'm, I think this price is fair for my tomato. Right? That farmer's not a price taker. They're setting prices. Right? Unlike most farmers, they're just price takers. Right? They're told what they have to get sell for, and they have no choice. So if you have like 89% of spending at a farmer's market is going to stay in that community versus only 45% at a Walmart. So I mean, that's a huge difference, right? I mean, you can literally invest your economy as you wish in your community, hopefully. Which brings me to, I'm sort of wrapping up here with some final thoughts, the idea of food sovereignty, which is a big issue for our organization. A lot of our allies are here, like National Family Farm Coalition. We have Food and Water Watch. We have lots of groups who work with on food sovereignty issues, U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. What does that mean? That means democratic local control of your food farm system. That's what that means. And I don't have to explain that to any Native American person. They've been fighting for sovereignty for ages, eons, right? And that's part of the reason genocide happens, right? You deny people sovereignty. I mean, that's why my ancestors came here. My ancestors were refugees from an orchestrated famine in Ireland. That famine was not natural. That famine was due to colonial policies. They were exporting food from Ireland during the famine. They had armed guards at the docks, loading up the food and shipping it out because it was under contract. Right? And that's, that's not a food sovereignty situation. So how do we reclaim our local economies? And food is by far the most important thing we need besides water, right? Goods, we have, there's sort of a distinction in economics between like relational goods and just, I guess I would call them, you know, commodities. Right? So a lot of us think everything's just a commodity. How many people here think food is just a commodity? Or is it more important than that? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, and I would argue water's like that. I would argue seeds are like that. I mean, a lot of the most important things are in economy involve a relationship. I mean, if you see a starving person, are you going to maybe help them with some food if you have extra? I mean, is that going to be part of your community spirit? I mean, I'm maybe not so worried about the apps on your cell phone. Oh, my gosh, you don't have all the apps on your cell phone. Let me please un upload some for you. No, but, but if I literally have a friend who's, like, not able to, sure, come and join us for a meal, right? So that's why we call it agriculture, not agribusiness. You see how important that distinction is? Agriculture, it, it's a relationship between people over something that's really important like food. Right? Food's just too important to be a commodity. So, and then we, that you know, the idea of like the Green New Deal. So like we, you know, we have, we still have vestiges of the old New Deal here, right? We talked about Aldo Leopold, lots of things. We had supply management back then. Idea that farmers actually get a fair price for their products. Farmer controlled reserves as a New Deal idea. Co-ops came out of the New Deal, right? Government's promoting co-ops as an alternative form. Agrarian reform. I mean, the government literally was giving land back to communities during the New Deal, right? To try to get people back on the land. So can we do that now? You know, can we come up with a way to reclaim, restore our rural economies? The farming we're doing right now 
can't do this, I would argue. It's basically an extractive industry. It's sucking resources out of our community, sending them far away, producing food we can't even eat half the time. We're importing 95% of the food we eat in Wisconsin right now. People know that? We're, we import 95% of the food we eat in Wisconsin now. So you drive around here, you see corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans. Where's all the fruits and vegetables coming from? We grow some here, but most of it we have to import, right? So I mean, it's something to think about, like how, if we're such a big agricultural powerhouse, why can't we grow our own food? This is true for the whole country, right? Not just Wisconsin. So if we're able to increase like soil in the, in the carbon in the soil, is that going to deal with things like flooding? Oh yeah, it will. I mean, if we can increase soil carbon by 1%, that's 25,000 gallons per acre of soil held, water held in the soil. I mean, that's why when we have, we, I mean, these original prairie soils we here had were 10, 12% carbon. Now we've destroyed them down to 2% with continuous monocultures, fertilizers, pesticides, destroying the soil as an ecosystem. So if we can like switch to more sustainable agroecology practices, we can literally not only have more nutritious food, but we could actually hold more water, you know, reduce runoff. There's all sorts of things we could be doing. That's part of what we hope in the Green New Deal. We try to get those ideas in there. Like we want to transform agriculture into a new system to help reduce climate change and all sorts of things. So what can come out of this? Self-help, mutual aid, reciprocity, solidarity. Those, I would argue, are the hallmarks of a really healthy economy. Okay, and that's something to think about. Like what groups, I mean, a lot of you have met all sorts of allies and groups here. I mean, the Grassroots Network is trying to build these ties. And we have groups like, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of the Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice and Sustainability. We have a Building Unity project. We're trying to bridge these organizations across the state. Um, we have a Dairy Together effort with the Farmers Union to try to save dairy farming in the state through promoting supply management, you know, antitrust action, ideas like that. So we have, I mean, there's all these potential out there. And a lot of it's just like we need to, with a new governor, maybe we have some openings, I'm hoping so, to actually transform our rural economy from sort of this hole which we're in after years of Walker and and industrial agriculture and so on. So I'll just end and we want to have some time for discussion with a quote from what Wendell Berry. So a lot of you have read Wendell Berry. He's actually a member of Family Farm Defenders. I've met him a few times. He's uh, written quite a few things. Um, but he, he wrote, the great enemy of freedom is the alignment of political power with wealth. This alignment destroys the commonwealth. People understand the difference? Okay, the commonwealth, the commons, right? We all share commons, right? That is a natural wealth, natural wealth of localities and the local economies of the household, the neighborhood and community. And by destroying that, they're destroying the, the very commonwealth, which is the foundation of our, of our, uh, of our politics. You know, that's, that's, I mean, we cannot have successful grassroots democracy without restoring our commonwealth. We all work together. In the